the main campus. Um, we're another hour beyond that. Um, but the Highlands Biological Station has been in existence since 1927. Um, so we're, we're rapidly approaching our 100th anniversary. But it's a field station where scientists have come from all over the world to study the plants and animals of our southern Appalachian mountains, particularly salamanders, which is the topic of tonight's um, presentation. Uh, my job there is kind of twofold. I am a biologist and I study primarily reptiles, amphibians, mainly salamanders, um, but also small mammals such as shrews, which I've done a talk about, I think, last year. Um, so with that, let me get my PowerPoint up and running, hopefully. And try that again. <laughs> Sorry. I'm struggling again. All right, what am I doing wrong? Uh, so you'll go to share and then it'll be screen and it should share your screen and then you can start the presentation. That's what I'm doing, but I don't see my window. Oh, there we go, sorry. <laughs> Now, so I think there we go. That you've set, shared it as a window instead of the screen. Um, so we'll just want to make sure that it's a, a screen share. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Sorry, folks. Bear with us as we try to right. this capture. All right. So good to go now. <laughs> yep. I think so. All right. They're very good. Sorry for the technical delay there. All right. So anyway, like I said, the. Highlands Biological Station is world famous for salamander research. You can see we've even incorporated it here in our logo. Um, tonight we're going to be learning more about the biology of salamanders, a little bit about why the Southern Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee has such a high a species diversity and some of the threats to biological diversity in this region. But let's begin with the basics, which is what a salamander is, um, because a lot of people get these confused with lizards. Um, but lizards and salamanders are two completely different things. Um, they belong in two different uh, classes of vertebrates. Lizards are reptiles. Salamanders are amphibians like frogs. So lizards are more closely related to snakes and turtles and alligators. Salamanders are more like frogs, despite their kind of superficial um, similarities. Reptiles like lizards, bodies are covered with scales. And if in, with the exception of like snakes, which don't have feet, they have claws. And there's a few exceptions to that, too. Amphibians, on the other hand, have smooth, slimy skin and no claws. So if you look at these pictures, this is a fence lizard. You can see it has these rough, dry scales. Some lizards have smooth, glossy scales. But nevertheless, they're covered with scales, which is thick pieces of skin um, that protects their bodies from abrasion, but also allows them to inhabit more um, arid, dry, hot environments because it, it seals in the moisture. Salamanders, on the other hand, like frogs, are amphibians. So they have these slimy skin and they have to live in very, very wet environments. We'll talk more about that later. And they don't have any claws. But their biggest differences has to do with their reproduction. Um, reptiles lay eggs with shells. Now they're leathery shells. They're not hard like a bird. But nevertheless, they have shelled eggs. But amphibians have these gelatinous um, shellless eggs. So here's a skink, which is a type of lizard, and a clutch of eggs. They usually bury them in the dirt and have these like, like uh, leathery shells. The salamanders, on the other hand, are shellless. They have this clear membrane. So they have to be laid, in the case of stream salamanders, in the water. But there's also lots of terrestrial salamanders, too. Um, they just lay theirs under wet leaves and rotting logs and things like that so they don't dry out. That's the purpose of the shell in a reptile is so that they can um, retain moisture inside the egg for the developing embryo. Since salamanders lay eggs in the water, they don't need a shell. And when they hatch, there's a big difference too. Okay, reptiles, if it's a turtle or a lizard, just hatches as a miniature version of the adult. So a little teeny tiny lizard, little teeny tiny snake, and so forth. Amphibians have to go through metamorphosis. So frogs have tadpoles, which turn into frogs. Salamanders uh, similarly have something that does the same thing. So 
um, this is an aquatic salamander, but it's very similar to that of a frog. So the salamander lays eggs, these gelatinous egg masses in the water. They hatch into these things, which are called larvae, which are the equivalent of frog tadpoles. And then they transform into the adult stage. So they go through metamorphosis. So this is a salamander. We call them larvae for, for salamanders, not tadpoles. This is a salamander larva uh, for an aquatic species. And you'll notice there's some fundamental differences between it and frogs. The first thing is that it already has legs. Sal uh, frogs, tadpoles have to grow their legs. Salamanders hatch already possessing legs. So, legs. so if you see a clutch of eggs in a pond, and you're not sure if they're like, say, wood frog eggs or spotted salamander eggs, if you look inside the egg and you can already see legs on the embryo, then it's salamander. The other big difference is that salamanders, most salamanders, have big bushy external gills as opposed to little slits or jets like at a frog uh, tadpole. They also have these flat heads for burrowing down into the mud and then a, a big tail fin for swimming. However, as I mentioned, there's lots of terrestrial salamanders. Many, many species live in the forest, so they wouldn't have a, you know, aquatic swimming larval form. Um, but nevertheless, they still go through metamorphosis. It's called direct development, and it, it's kind of oversimplified, but basically it goes through metamorphosis in the egg, and then it hatches. But nevertheless, it goes through a form of metamorphosis. So they hatch out as these little tiny, we call them metamorphs for those terrestrial species. Um, some other kind of general characteristics of salamanders, like all amphibians, they're ectothermic, cold-blooded. That doesn't mean their blood is cold. It means they can't generate their own body heat. So if, if it's hot outside, they're hot on the inside. If it's cold outside, they're cold on the inside. They can't maintain a constant body temperature like a mammal does, or, for example. Um, most salamanders breathe straight through their skin. And, and for most species, it's, that's exclusively how they respire, is through their skin. We'll talk more about that later. Um, they don't really have eardrums. And unlike a frog, fertilization of the, of the eggs takes place internally for most species, not externally. In the case of a frog, the female lays eggs in the pond, and then the male deposits sperm onto the eggs um, in the water. But in a salamander, fertilization takes place inside the female's body. They're, they just don't have the reproductive organs of, say, a, a mammal to do this. We'll talk more about that momentarily. If you want to know if it's a male or female, it depends on the species, but for the wide variety of ones that occur in the mountains, um, you can flip it over if it's a full grown adult and look at its chin. So males, if it's large enough, will have a, a circle, a disc on their throat, and it's our chin rather, and it's called a mental gland, and that's used for courtship behavior. Um, when they're full of sperm, their cloaca, their, their opening will swell, and then many species have these little whisker things called cirri, which help funnel in pheromones for mating. All right, so the way that, excuse me, salamanders reproduce, is like I said, fertilization is internal. They just don't have a delivery system. Instead, the male deposits this little packet of sperm called a spermatophore on a rock or something like that. And then they do this little conga line. So what it is, is this is the male with his mental gland, and he rubs it all over the female. And it's, it excites her. It's like Axe Body Spray for salamanders. Because they're all excited and wants to mate. So she, then she, uh, she will go around behind him. And like I said, they do this little conga line walk called a tail straddling walk. And as they walk forward, he will deposit this packet of sperm on the ground. And then she will walk over it and take it up into her cloaca where the eggs are fertilized. We have had, um, we have lots of researchers over the years coming to the Highlands Biological Station. Um, and for over 30 years, we had researchers from Oregon State, I think it is, um, come to the basement of our nature center because it's all dark and moldy and wet down there and do these experiments. They have these salamanders, they put them in little plastic shoe boxes and um, they've done mating behavior, territoriality, but they put one salamander in a box and then they'll introduce a foreign salamander and let, a, let them fight it out or mate or whatever. But they call it the red light district because they have red lights so they can observe them at night when they won't disturb their behavior and for other reasons. Um, some general things about their ec ecology and habitats. Like we said, they're amphibians, so salamanders need to live in very wet environments, such as the southern Appalachian Mountains. So you're going to find more salamanders or more species on north-facing slopes. Um, in North America, or the northern hemisphere, 
north facing slopes get more or less, I should say, afternoon sun. They're more in the shadow. Um, so it's going to retain more moisture. That's why moss grows on the north sides of trees and so forth. But you can see differences in animals and in plants on even adjacent slopes. So north facing slopes tend to have lots of rhododendron thickets, um, deep leaf litter layer, and it's very wet. Whereas south facing slopes are hotter and drier, they tend to get more pine forests and more reptiles, snakes and things on the south facing slopes. They require a le deep leaf litter layer to hide or uh, hide in and also it retains moisture and in insect prey. You find them inside rotting logs again for the moisture content and, and the abundant insects and then around seeps and streams, especially those that have lots of rocks. They are active by day, but they're most active at night, especially after a rain. Each summer at the Highlands Nature Center, we have an event called the Salamander Meander, where we take people out in our garden trails with flashlights just to observe the salamanders. They're just crawling around everywhere on the surface at night, especially if it hasn't rained for a while and then it rains, they all rush to the surface to take advantage of that moisture. Um, so salamander researchers here, they're night owls. They go out, you know, midnight is when they start and they go to bed at sunrise so they can observe all these behaviors. Um, but they're a very important part of forest floor food webs. They're one of the main um, insect population controllers. They're so abundant here in the mountains. They feed lot on lots of insects, other invertebrates, such as spiders and snails and whatnot. But other things eat them as well, snakes, shrews, and often each other, depending on the species. But in the southern Appalachian Mountains, they are the most abundant invertebrate organism, even more than birds. Densities can be as high as one or two salamanders per square meter. So an area about this big, will have usually one salamander in, in, in a mature forest. They're just very secretive, so you don't see them very often, but they are present. Um, as I mentioned, they can be found at least by day um, inside and underneath rotting logs. So if you don't want to go out at midnight, you can flip over logs and rocks um, and find them that way. There's actually a Forest Service decomposition uh, class scale for logs, because not each type of log functions the same ecologically. Um, if it's a freshly fallen log that's green and off the ground by its branches, that's a class one. And then as it progresses, it gets to class four which and five, which is like mush. These are the ones preferred by salamanders because they can penetrate. It's, it's soft enough they can penetrate inside. It's very spongy. These things serve as kind of lifeboats of moisture when there's drought, too. These salamanders will congregate under these um, wet logs to, to remain wet. And there's, it's a source of insect prey as well. In streams, rocks are going to be extremely important. Again, for protective cover, it's where they deposit their eggs. So this is a clutch of eggs that's been lifted up, and the mother usually guards the nest. And it's a place where they can feed on uh, aquatic insects like stoneflies and, and whatnot that might be under the rock as well. But an often overlooked part of salamander habitat is the vegetation around it, the forest surrounding these streams. Um, Salamanders that live in streams don't remain exclusively in the streams. At night, they venture far out of the streams because that's where they find more insect prey and that's where they mate. So this vegetative buffer around the stream, you know, it shades the streams, it keeps the water cooler, which is important also for things like trout. Um, it mitigates runoff and erosion. It keeps it from, from getting into the creek. Um, but it's also the source of the food chain. All these leaves and things fall into the creek and then these aquatic insects, you know, shred up the little leaves and stuff, and it provides food for them, and then they in turn are eaten by salamanders. Uh, these leaves that fall in the creeks also serve as microhabitat for salamander larvae. So when you want to study them, you put little mesh bags in a creek and stuff it full of leaves, and then the larvae will burrow it down into these things, and you can dump out the bags and find the larvae that way. And again, it's a foraging area for a uh, the salamanders, that's, and that's where they get their prey and where they do most of their mating is on land. So a little narrow strip of, of plants around a creek is not enough. Salamanders would venture as far as like 100 meters out of the creek. So the surrounding forest is very, very important. Okay. Um, when you study salamanders, you often want to know the size of the salamander and you measure it, but you usually only measure from the snout to the vent, which is the base of the tail. You don't usually include the tail link because tails can often break off. This is a defense mechanism also present in lizards. Um, so if a predator gets it by the tail, they can snap off their tail and escape. 
And that's bad because they've lost their tail, but at least they're still alive. And they do regenerate over time. However, salamanders do a much better job than lizards do. When a lizard loses its original tail, um, it just regenerates a rod of cartilage. But salamanders actually regenerate the bone, or the vertebrae, too. In fact, salamanders can regenerate fingers and toes also. So they have amazing regenerative abilities. Um, in the old days, that's how scientists used to st uh, the study salamanders, used to mark them. Um, if you're studying something like a bear, you know, you can put a radio collar on them with a number or a ear tag or something like that. But you can't really do that for a salamander. So instead, they clip a toe. Maybe salamander number one, two, three, and so forth. Um, we don't do that as much now because there's better methods that don't hurt the salamander. Um, usually, they just kind of tattoo it with this kind of um, fluorescent dye under the skin, and they can mark it that way. But that's a way to do it, and they do regenerate them over time. The other thing is all salamanders are slimy because they're amphibians, but the terrestrial species, those that live in the woods, have to have extra defenses. They can't just swim away like an aquatic species. So they exude this really noxious glue-like slime from their tails. So if you pick up a, a species of salamander in the woods, expect your hands to get just like covered with a sticky stuff. And it does not wash off with soap and water. You have to get a nail brush and scrub, 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 scrub to get that off. But anyway, it makes them taste nasty so that predators like birds won't want to eat them. And the third thing is that, like I was saying, most salamanders respire through their skin. Um, this is an extreme case of one that escaped for our from our nature center and we didn't find until the next morning. But you can see it's all dried up like a raisin. But even if you're catching one and you hold it for too long, it'll start to get sticky, like those little toy octopus things you can throw on the wall and they roll down. If it starts getting like that, um, then it can't breathe. It has to remain wet. So always keep it in a bag of leaves or something like that that, that is wet so it can breathe. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a map of the United States, and this is actually kind of outdated, but it illustrates that the Southern Appalachian region, uh, Western North Carolina, um, Northwest Georgia, Eastern Tennessee, and so forth, Southwest Virginia, is the salamander capital of North America, and perhaps even the whole world. Um, there's more salamanders here than any place else. And there's lots of reasons for that, which we'll get to. But here's the breakdown of salamanders. So again, they're amphibians. They're in their own class, separate from lizards. Um, the order for salamanders is caudata. Sometimes you'll see it as urodella. Um, but nevertheless, it's amphibians that have tails versus frogs, which are tailless amphibians. And in this region of Western North Carolina, there's four main families of salamanders. There's actually a fifth because we're starting to find more and more mud puppies, um, but they're kind of rare. But anyway, there are four main species of salamanders, but almost all of those 50 plus species belong to this last group, fam family Plethodon today. There's just a handful in these other groups. So let's go through those right now. The first group, family Cryptobranchidae only has one species in it in all of North America. There's different subspecies, but it's all one species. And that's the hellbender. This is a very, very large salamander that lives in uh, rivers. It's related to the Pacific giant salamander, um, but not quite as big. They get like four feet, but this, this still gets up to like two feet long. Um, you find them under really big flat rocks where they blend in with a river bottom and they eat primarily crayfish. And again, they respire mainly through their skin. So they have all these wrinkles, which increases the surface area for oxygen absorption. Um, in North Carolina, this is a state listed um, protected species, a species of special concern, not endangered, but nevertheless, you can't go out and just collect these things without all sorts of special permitting. Sometimes uh, fishermen will catch them accidentally on their hooks, um, but that's a little different, but you can't actively go out and search them without proper permitting. But they get, they get its name because it's this kind of ugly creature from hell, and they bend and twist their bodies all around and stuff like that. The second group is family Imbistomatidae, or mole salamanders, because like a mole, not because they have spots that look like moles, uh, but like a mole, the animal, the mammal, they live underground in tunnels. They don't burrow them, the tunnels themselves, but they occupy tunnels of other things like um, mice and shrews, and moles or uh, just hollows from uh, tree roots. <clears throat> the most common in Western North Carolina is the spotted salamander. Um, occasionally you'll get the marbled salamander. That's more typical of the uh, central and Eastern part of North Carolina. And then out towards the coast, you also can get um, mo true mole salamanders and um, tiger salamanders, but they're all part of this group. But this group is mainly um, 
it's kind of like a frog with a tail that lives underground. They have lungs, um, they're large, um, but because they live underground, you don't see them very often unless you just get lucky and happen to dig one up. The only time they're really surface active is very, very early spring. So like the last little bit of February, early March, the kind of first warm rain we get at the end of winter, they'll all rush to the surface and go to the breeding ponds and lay their eggs, and then they go back underground again. So you have just a, like a couple of weeks window where there are a lot of them on the surface and then they kind of disappear again. The third group, again, only has one species in it, and that's a uh, fam family Salamandridae or newts. And many people ask, well, what's the difference between a newt and a salamander? A newt is just one group of salamanders. But what makes them different is that they undergo metamorphosis twice. So they start off in the pond as a swimming larval form, and then they transform into the eft, EFT, eft stage, which is bright red and it lives up in the forest. And then over the next like six, 10 years, they transform again into the adult stage, which is olive green, has little red dots and has a flat tail and goes back to the pond again. So it goes from the pond to the forest and then back to the pond. And if you'll notice, it's it, even as an adult, it has red dots. But in this F stage, it's this bright, almost fluorescent orange red color. And you might think, well, that's not very good because they're not camouflaged. Um, but they are poisonous. Many people ask, are salamanders poisonous? And the answer really is no, except for newts. But that's if you eat them. They're not like poison dart frogs of the Amazon that you can't touch. These are poisonous if you ate large quantities of them. So don't do that and you should be fine. But if you're handling with kids that I tell them, like, don't like touch it and then like rub your eyes or, or stick your fingers in your mouth or something like that. But again, that's just a, a few species. All the rest, all the 40 plus other species in Western North Carolina belong to family Plethodon today. These are the lungless salamander group. They respire directly through their skin. They may have uh, gills as the larval form, but as adults, they respire exclusively through their skin. Um, but within this group, there's, again, just mainly two groups. There's the genus Plethodon, which is the woodland terrestrial forest dwelling salamanders. Um, again, they're terrestrial. They have the direct development, no, no swimming larvae, and they exude that noxious, sticky slime from their tails. And then genus Desmognathus, which are the dusky or stream-dwelling salamanders. They're semi-aquatic and they have aquatic larvae. And then there's a handful of other genera too that are semi-aquatic. This group communicates through sense of smell. So I mentioned those researchers down um, from Oregon that do research in the basement of the Nature Center. Um, it's all chemical cues. So they defend their territories through chemical cues. They mate through chemical cues. So they have these little grooves um called nasolabial grooves that funnel smells into their nostrils and these cirri do the same thing but that's how they they can communicate with one another um even if you don't know the species of salamander it's pretty easy to tell whether it's a plethodon the, the forest salamanders or a desmognathus which is the stream salamanders unless it's one of those miscellaneous other ones um the terrestrial plethodon first of all they're going to be in the forest and they're going to have sticky skin and so forth but looking at it, their hind legs and their back leg, or hind legs and their front legs are more or less the same size. Whereas in the Desmognathus, the stream ones, they have really fat, chunky back legs compared to their front. The other thing is the Desmognathus have this cheek stripe. It goes from their eye to the corner of their jaw, and I think that's a remnant of their gills. Um, so, for example, this is a whole bunch of different species of plethodon. They're not all found here right in Highlands where I am, but across Western North Carolina. So this is a Yonalasi salamander. This is a gray-cheeked salamander. This is called the Southern Appalachian salamander, red-legged, Southern redback, and wellers. And there's many, many others. But if you'll notice, see the back legs and the front legs are more or less the same size. They might be a little bigger in the back, but more or less the same size. And there's an absence of a cheek stripe on all of these compared to the Desmognathus, the stream ones, you can see here it has really chunky back legs compared to the front and this little pale cheek stripe there, 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 um, and so forth. This is a seal salamander, a black belly, a coeys, a, a pygmy salamander, shovel nose, and there's many, 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 many others depending on what part of the mountains you're in. In some parts of the mountains, 
you have a plethodon, a terrestrial one, coexisting with a Desmonathus, because the streams are in the forest. So they, there's kind of an inter overlap zone. Um, but remember, the plethodons have that extra defense, that slime. So that helps them survive over something that, like the Desmonathus. So if you're a bird, you would prefer to eat a Desmonathus without the slime. So where um, you get some of these with like red legs, you might find a version of this Echoe salamander that also has red legs to fool predators. It's a mimic. In streams, um, again, it depends heavily on where you are in the state, um, but across the mountain region, you're going to get mainly three, these three kinds plus some others. So the black belly salamander is widespread. This is the, one of the largest ones. It's about the size of your thumb. The head you can get up to that. Um, it has a black belly when it's an adult. It has a very flat tail for swimming. Um, then you have a seal salamander, which is kind of a medium-sized salamander with a somewhat flattened tail. And then an okoe salamander, which has a round tail because it doesn't really do a lot of swimming as an adult. It lives around streams, but not really in the stream. Um, Depending on where you are in the state, this can be replaced by similar species. We're going to call them, um, this make this Orestes and a Carolinensis and, and several others, but it all looks like this. For a long time, those were all called the same thing, and then they've been split into different species over the years. Um, but the reason I'm showing you that is because these species are not just randomly distributed in the streams. There's actually a pattern to them, their distribution. Um, each, the stream consists of lots of different smaller microhabitats, and each of these species fills a unique niche. Um, that's another reason that in, uh, adds to species diversity because all these little species fill every little nook and cranny even within a stream. So these big black bellies are typically found in the center of the stream in the water flow <clears throat> because they're larger and they can withstand the current. That's one reason. But also they're the largest so they're kind of the bullies. They get the first pick. So the safest habitat to be microhabitat to be in is the deep water because you're safer from terrestrial predators like raccoons and so forth. Um, so the next biggest, which is the seal salamander, gets second pick, which is the stream edges. Um, it's not as good as being in the deep water, but at least you're still in the water. And then the runts, the small ones, get all the leftovers. So they're usually found up on the bank and deeper into the forest. So you get this nice pattern of big to small salamanders moving outward from the stream. They're also face this way because they eat one another. So the small ones have to avoid the larger one. So it's competition and predation that's driving these patterns. Um, then there's some, again, other kind of miscellaneous genera. One is Eurycia. This is the long-tailed salamander. This is a super common one called the two-lined salamander. It's two little black lines. There's also a three-lined salamander. This is a spring salamander, which is this kind of orange or pinkish, purplish one with little black dots that lives in water springs. They also have a little black kind of mustache. And then the red salamander, which is heavily spotted um, and it tends to be a little more in the forest, but they're, um, they have aquatic larvae and has a black chin in my region. These though are not really toxic. They're newt mimics. They look like a newt, so birds avoid them. Um, and then there is one endangered species, at least state listed, endangered species of salamander, the green salamander. It is found primarily across the Blue Ridge Escarpment before you drop off an elevation in the South Carolina. So just little isolated populations of those. Um, they're found primarily in boulder fields and rock outcrops where this green color blends in with lichen and moss growing on the rocks. Um, we're finding out, though, that even though it's still a rare species, it may not be quite as rare as we once thought because now they're finding more of these in places they haven't looked before, such as tree canopies. So sometimes they're way up in the treetops, too. Okay, any questions so far before I continue? Good? Yep, nothing's showing up in the chat this time. All right, good. Well, I mean, it's okay if there is, but I'll move on. All right, so that's a little bit about the biology of salamanders, but what, what is it about the Southern Appalachians that allows for such a wondrous diversity of salamanders? Why are there so many different kinds? Well, species diversity consists of two things. It's species richness, which is the number of species and species evenness, which is the abundance of each type of species. So the sub Southern Appalachians is um, diverse in both of these, has lots and lots of species and then tons of each of those species, except for certain ones. 
Um, there's many reasons for that. First thing, of course, is our topography. So unlike, you know, Kansas, where it's all just flat prairie, the mountains have elevational ranges. It can go down to less than 100 feet or 1,000 feet down in the valleys, all the way up to greater than 6,000 feet at places like Clingman's Dome or, or Mount Mitchell up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, so as you increase in elevation, of course, the temperatures drop, the vegetation changes, and the climate changes. So it's mimicking actually a change in latitude as you go up the mountain. So every thousand foot elevation you climb is the equivalent of traveling 300 miles north. So it's, by the time you go all the way up to like Mount Mitchell, you're in the a climate, a habitat that's very similar to what you find in Canada. So we have a lot of species that um, traverse that region. And so you wind up with an overlap in the Southern Appalachians of Northern species at high elevations that are more like Canada, and then low elevate Southern species at low elevations. So right where I am in Southern Appalachians, you get both, you get Northern and Southern in the same region, it doubles our species diversity. The second is the age of the mountains. The Southern Appalachians are really, really old. Um, if you've been on the Blue Ridge Parkway, you've probably seen these granite domes that are all smooth and rounded and eroded, unlike the Rockies, which are newer mountains and all jagged. So that they're, they're really, really old. And that relates to the Ice Age history. So during the Pleistocene, most of North America was covered by uh, the Wisconsin Glacier. And those northern species were forced southward to escape the ice. And that's true for not just for salamanders, but all sorts of things, even plants. Um, they traveled down the, south, the Appalachian Mountains to our region, and that was kind of the terminus where they could escape the ice. And they remained here, because when the ice melted, the, the climate here is the same, so there's no need to go back. So we have a lot of what we call northern relic species at high elevations. Um, so not just these salamanders, but you get like, you know, spruce fir forest at high elevations and red squirrels and, and other things that you typically find much farther north. Um, but again, the climate here is super favorable for salamanders. Um, salamanders need to be cool and wet so they can survive and reproduce. Um, and this region is the second wettest region in North America. Only the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle and places like that, receive more annual rainfall on average than we do. We've been um, collecting rainfall data here at the Highlands Biological Station since the 60s, and the average rainfall here in Highlands is 86 inches of rain a year. That's the average. Some years we exceed 100 inches of rain. So we are technically a temperate rainforest, and wherever there's lots of rain, you're going to get lots of life. So not just salamanders, but all sorts of things that need moisture. So this is the also the fungus capital, uh, mushrooms of, of North America, um, snails, um, ferns and mosses and lichens and on and on and on and on and on. Um, but yeah, the relative humidity is twice that of the Rockies. Its average is 95%. So all the researchers and students that come and spend the summer here, we tell them like your, your towels will never dry. You're hanging them up. You've got to put them in the dryer. But that's great if you're a salamander because it allows you to breathe through your skin and so forth. But that just explains why you know lots of salamanders live here. It doesn't explain why there's so many kinds of salamanders. That has to do with reproductive isolation. So um, these mountaintops, here's some kind of sticking out of a cloud bank. They resemble islands in an ocean. And so if these were islands in an ocean, a salamander is not going to like swim across the ocean to get to another island to find a mate. And similarly, they're not going to climb all the way down the mountain, cross the valley, climb this other mountain to find a, a mate. They're going to be kind of stuck on these little mountain tops. So over time, um, you know, inbreeding occurs here and inbreeding occurs here, and they adapt individually from one another, and it results in different species on different mountain tops. It's called allopatric speciation, species as a result of being geographically isolated from one another. Um, so here's a map of Western North Carolina, and not each individual mountain, but each in individual mountain range, as shown here, has different stuff on it. So even in Macon County, where I am, um, here in Highlands, you get one species here, but if you drive just to the other side of the county, it's a different mountain range, and you get different stuff, at least a lot of different stuff. There's some overlap. Um, so the way allopatric speciation works is, historically, it was all one big population. Um, and then over time, either a physical or physiological barrier will emerge. So it could be, you know, a river forms, or it could just be a hot, dry valley that's too, you know, too arid for a salamander to cross. 
And so you wind up with two separate populations, and over time they evolve into two different species. Um, and that's what we observe here. So mountain A will have one species, mountain B will have another species, and then often there's nothing in between because that's the barrier they can't cross. Um, so here's what I was talking about. This is Macon County. Um, this side, we get these gray cheek salamanders and over in Asheville and so forth. Um, but if you go just over the mountain to further west, you don't get this gray cheek salamander anymore. It's replaced by the red legged salamander. And if you go up into Great Smoky Mountains National Park, you don't get either one of those. They have red cheeks up there and on and on and on and on and on. So, um, but to make things more complicated, those are easily, you can tell those apart because they look different. One has red cheeks, one has gray cheeks, one has red legs. But a lot of salamanders look exactly the same, but they are different species because they're geographically isolated. Um, previously, we thought they were all the same thing, but now that we can do DNA studies, we can say, gosh, they look the same, but they are not the same. So that's another reason we have such high diversity. It's not really that we're discovering new species, it's that we're determining that what was once thought as the same thing are actually two or three different things. And to make things even more complicated, in some places, these two formerly isolated populations are coming back into contact and forming hybrid salamanders. There's a couple of examples of that. Um, that's usually based on elevation. So usually having high elevation and low elevation when they're usually separated and now they're reestablishing contact. And so it's basically the reverse of allopatric speciation. You have two uh, different populations, the berries removed, they come back into contact and resume in uh, interbreeding. Um, and there's different outcomes for that. They could resume interbreeding and merge back into just one hybrid species. Or it could be that if the hybrids are inferior, less genetically fit than either of the two parents, then you'll just remain this little narrow hybrid band, but then still have the two parent populations. Or it's possible that they could continue to evolve and form a third species. Um, again, it's usually based on elevation. So um, you have species one at the mountaintops, species two down in the valleys, and you would expect the perfect kind of 50-50 blend of traits to exist halfway up the mountain. And we'll come back to that in a little while. But here's an example. So in, in Macon County, where I am, on the mountaintops, you get red-legged salamanders. And then down the mountain towards Georgia, you get these southern Appalachian salamanders that have white dots. And halfway up the mountain, they have red legs and white dots. So it's pretty cool. Here's another example. Um, if you go to the end of the Blue Ridge Parkway, excuse me, towards Cherokee, um, up on the parkway, they have red, uh, I'm sorry, they're all gray. And then down in Smok the Smokies, down in Cherokee, they have red cheeks. Um, but as you go down the mountain, they get a little redder and redder and redder and redder and redder on their cheeks. All right, so that's why we have so many species, but species diversity is at risk. And there's lots of reasons for that. One, of course, is habitat loss. Um, this is a clear cut. There's no shade. It's like the surface of Mars. It's all sunbaked. Obviously, a salamander cannot survive there. There's no insects. Even those in the creek are at risk because of all the sedimentation and lack of shade and increased temperatures and so forth. So that was pretty obvious. Um, many, many years ago, I worked on a study at UNC Asheville looking at the effects of clear cutting by the Forest Service on salamander species. Um, and there's a very clear correlation relationship with um, number of salamanders and number of species with age. And that's due primarily to increases in moisture within an old growth forest versus a recent clear cut. Um, the Forest Service doesn't do really large scale clear cuts much anymore. They do these little small patches, but that can be equally bad because this creates barriers. Salamanders can't cross this. So now you have this little island of trees, but you create, create genetic bottlenecks because they can't escape this little patch of, uh, of trees. It's a little forest there. Um, urbanization. This is Gatlinburg, Tennessee, right in the heart of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, surrounded by salamanders. But you're going to be really hard pressed to find salamanders, you know, down in Harris Cherokee Casino or whatever. Um, roads, um, they can be run over, of course. Sometimes they put culverts under the road to allow wildlife to cross. Um, 
But if it's just a road, it's not just the risk of being run over. They won't cross this. They're exposed. They're just too hot. So you're, you're creating dispersal barriers. Um, I worked on another study looking at power line right away. So you might think, well, that's not like a road. At least it's vegetated and so forth. But they don't really cross it for the same reason. They're too exposed. It's too hot and dry. You do find salamanders living in the power line right away, um, but they're extremely limited in their mobility. They spend all day down in a hole and they'll emerge only at night when the air humidity is higher and the temperatures are cooler. And to make things worse, they often come through and spray um, herbicides to kill the vegetation under the power line right away. So that can kill the salamanders directly. Um, wetland destruction. So this is the National Forest near Highlands where I am. This is a healthy creek. This is what it should look like. This is Mill Creek in downtown Highlands. So uh, if you've ever, if you don't know what Highlands is like, it's it's a very wealthy community and it's it's kind of unique because it's an urbanized headwaters. Typically, headwater streams are up on the mountainside in the National Forest. Um, but here we have a town right at the head of of Mill Creek, which feeds into the Colisage River and eventually into the Little Tennessee River. Um, so this is actually the good part. This part actually has some forest around it, but typically, um, you know, the roads and people's yards are right up to it. So there's no vegetative buffer, all this mud and sediment. There's no rocks because they're all buried in the mud for salamanders to live under. In addition, you know, you get runoff from the roads and, and people's lawns, like or pesticides, or herbicides, and on and on and on. Um, acidification. So this is a picture from, I think, Mount Mitchell. It might be Clingman's Dome. But nevertheless, you see all these dead spruce fir trees. Now, a lot of that was actually killed by the, an insect called the balsam woolly adelgid. There's a hemlock woolly adelgid that's currently killing a lot of our hemlock trees, too. But it's an invasive aphid from Asia. Um, but they were weakened heavily by acid rain at these high elevations. Um, some of that comes from Tennessee. The In years ago, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority and in, in, uh, Tennessee, their solution to the Clean Air Act was to double the height of their smokestacks. So all the pollution blows out of Tennessee and into North Carolina instead. Um, but also you can get acid, acid, acid leaching out of these rocks. Um, this is Newfound Gap or near Newfound Gap in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And this isn't just granite. It's a rock called Anakista rock, which is highly acidic. So they dynamite this to make the roadbed. And so years ago, I looked at a study looking at streams below and above the road cut. Above the road cut, um, healthy stream, tons of salamanders. Below the road cut in that stream, almost nothing because the pH of the water was so low from the acid leaching out of these rocks. Um, then, of course, chemical runoff, fertilizer, pesticides, and so forth. This is from Dillsboro, which is between Silva and Franklin, um, close to the going up toward the Smokies. Um, from 1967, I think it says, but this is the Tuckasegee River, and you can see this dark stuff. That's effluent from the old paper mill back then. Now, it's not that bad now, of course, thank goodness, but back then, they would just dump stuff straight into the river. So if you're a hellbender, you know, you'd want to live this part of the stream, not way down here where all the pollution is. But also an often overlooked one is road salts. Um, we get lots of ice and snow, so they treat the roads every winter storm with the salt brine. Well, that salt washes off the roads and winds up in creeks and rivers and stuff. Um, and the salinity can affect, if not the salamanders themselves, at least the eggs um, development or the larvae. Um, we have lots of PhD students that come and do their doctoral dissertations here at the Highlands Biological Station in surrounding forest. We had a student some years ago looking at um, salamanders and other amphibians on golf courses. Highlands is, again, an affluent community. We have, I don't know how many, six or eight golf courses in this region. Um, so he was going around looking at amphibians in these ponds and rivers at golf courses, and he found lots of deformities. Here's a three-legged um, spotted salamander and a deformed frog. Um, but that's kind of a rarity. Usually what he was finding was that the eggs themselves just wouldn't ever hatch. So we're getting declines in salamanders um, because of the eggs' mortality. But to their credit, a lot of the uh, a lot of the golf courses, um, he, he presented his findings at these golf courses that allowed him to do the studies here, and they've changed some of their practices. So they planted more vegetation around the streams to help prevent runoff. They've changed some of the chemicals and, and on and on and on to try to, to mitigate that somewhat. Um, there's other things. You've probably heard of the chytrid fungus um, that's been implicated in worldwide frog declines. 
Um, but it is present in salamanders as well. It doesn't seem to affect them as bad, but it is present. So whenever we do studies, especially in the Smokies, there's all these strict regulations. You can't just like touch a salamander and then touch another salamander. You have to change, you have to wear rubber gloves and change them between everything. And you have to put them in individual plastic bags of, to try to avoid any cross contamination if that chytrid fungus is present. And then there's other diseases and things that can kill salamanders as well. Um, another one is invasive species. Um, earthworms, for example, there's lots of native earthworms. But many of the earthworms that you find in the southern Appalachians is an invasive species. I forget where it's from, but it, it was introduced primarily through fishing bait. People dump out their fish bait, but it's not from here. And they reproduce like crazy and they strip the leaf litter layer down to bare rock. So there's no uh, microhabitat for them to hide in. It dries the surface. Um, and there's also um, fewer invertebrates in for them to eat. And then, of course, the last thing is global climate change. So as the earth is warming, um, it's going to get too hot and dry for salamanders, even for those that live down the mountain in these valleys. So they're going to be forced up the mountain to escape the heat. But there's already salamanders at the top of the mountain, which brings us back to this uh, hybrid zone I was talking about. So scientists monitor where this hybrid zone is. And again, if everything's kind of normal, you would expect the 50-50 traits to be halfway up the mountain. But if we start seeing this 50-50 traits higher and higher and higher and higher and higher up the mountain, that's indicating that these low ele elevation species are actually invading, moving up the mountain. And if that continues, they're going to, you know, there's not going to be any high elevation species left. They're all going to be hybrids at the mountaintops. So a lot of these species that we showed you earlier um, in, you know, 20, 50 years may cease to exist as a pure parent species. If as these low elevation species climb up the mountain. And with that happy note, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. This is our website if you want to learn more about the Highlands Biological Station. Um, we just finished up our summer courses. We have college courses every two weeks. We have, we have a lot of public workshops, but the public part of our station is the Highlands Nature Center and Botanical Gardens, and there's still events going on there. You can come to the garden and wander through the trails anytime, even if the building of uh, the Nature Center is not open. So I will stop my presentation and I'll take any questions you may have. All right, folks, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to throw those in the chat or to unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon to ask your question out loud if that is an easier option for you. Um, with that, we'll turn it over to anyone that has a question. Um, I know right off the bat, this has been fascinating for me. Um, I don't know how much uh, you're in touch with research down here in the Triangle area, but are they seeing a lot of hybridization within across the state, or is it more focused in the mountains where the elevation changes? Can to, kind to my of knowledge, more in the that. mountains where the elevation, but there's not as many species in the Piedmont and Coastal Plain anyway um, mm -hmm. compared to the mountains. Like we have 50 plus here, and you have you know maybe a dozen out there, in, and they're not all of that same group either. You have a lot more you know mole salamanders and, and spotted salamanders and into different groups. You have also have things like sirens and amphiumas out on the coast that are not present in the mountains. So the first question we have is how long does it take for salamanders to fully grow their tails back? Yeah, that's a hard one to answer. Um, I'm sure somebody knows. I don't know, but you find them often with different states of regrowth. Um, but how long it actually takes to fully regrow, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Mm. Looks like I've got some few people chatting. All right. So uh, we have someone that says they're in Alamance County. What species should they expect to see? I have to remind me where Alamance County is. Uh, it's on the coast, I'm, I'm correct? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, if we're wrong on that, let us know. <laughs> yeah, there's there's very few of the plethodontid salamanders out there, the lungless kinds. That's That tends to be more of a mountain thing, although they do exist out there. Um, but you get more of those, um, the embisted salamanders, like the like spotted salamanders and and marble salamanders and, and things like that. I was in the Piedmont, Burlington area, that's right. Um, so it's kind of, a, it still kind of applies. The, most of these ones are mountain species, and you, it's kind of a handful. The best source for finding out what's in your area is uh, ncherps.org. It's put out by Davidson College, and it lists all the different species in the state, and you can click on it, and it gets nice range maps and everything. And it's not just salamanders, it's not snakes, lizards, frogs, everything.
on. <laughs> Okay, questions popping up. All right, so what is the reasoning or adapt adaptation benefits for that uh, for the one type of salamanders that goes back into the water as an adult? Oh, um, I'm not <laughs> I'm <stumped. laughs> um, but but they just have an aquatic life cycle. So why they go onto land and back? I don't have to think about that one. I have to think about the actual ecological reasoning for that. Um, it may just be to avoid competition at different life stages and stuff too, but I'm not completely sure. I saw somebody ask what my favorite salamander was. Um, I like the Yonalasi one, which is one of the ones I showed you early on. It has a, it's not found here in Highlands, unfortunately, but it's found Asheville and up towards Boone. Um, it's one that has a dark brick red back to it. It's just really, really pretty. <laughs> So here in the Piedmont region, do we tend to find more of the river stream type of salamanders or more woodland uh, species? You'll find more pond and stream um, than the wood. Yeah, I mean, I won't say they're not there, but you get, you know, newts, obviously, and spotted salamanders um, and creeks. I, I used to work in Reedsville, which is near Greensboro, um, so I know a little bit about what's there. And so uh, we would get um, one called a it's in that dusky group but it's a different species it's called desmonetus fuscus which is the dusky salamander um, and then a two line a version of a two line salamander it's a different kind than what we have in the mountains um, it's like the carolina two line or something like that versus the blue ridge two line that i have here but it looks the same so in recent years you mentioned that uh dna testing has helped diversify the species populations that we have we know that we have are we finding a significant difference between the like tons more than we initially thought because of the dna differences that they look the same but they are actually different when when these dna techniques were perfected then yes we got to suddenly like all these people were splitting 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 i'm, I'm tending to be more of a lumper um, i like to kind of keep things the same especially because they keep changing the names on me i learn all these scientific names and then they decide they're <laughs> well, this one in this county is different from that county, so we have to learn all these new names and stuff. Um, but there's a little less of that going on because we're not really discovering new speed, like new animals. We're just determining that they were genetically different. And they, those have largely been kind of already identified, although people continue to split them mm -hmm. even further and further. The only kind of new salamander that's been found in the last 15 years or so is the a little itty bitty salamander called the patch nose salamander and the type locality is down the mountain in georgia not too far from us um but from head to tail it's only the diameter of a dime Oof. it's a little bitty but has a little red patch on his nose but i besides being a really really small salamander um i bring that one up because it's scientific name is eucalyptus brucei which is named after richard bruce a former director of the highlands biological station very cool. Um, you mentioned the green, was it the green salamander, I believe, that lives up in trees? Are there other species that live in trees, or has it just been that one that you all discovered, that's been discovered by I'm, I'm sure there are, like, in, in the Amazon and stuff, but locally, that's the only one I'm aware of, and that's a more recent kind of, I don't know if it's been unknown, but more research has been done lately on that, and we're discovering them in more places than we once thought, um, but they've found that out by putting this that's just like those mesh bags we put in the rivers creeks to catch larval salamanders they put mesh bags on the sides of trees and mm -hmm. you can catch these salamanders going up and down the trees they hide in these little mesh bags so I, I haven't been personally involved with that but i've we've had speakers here at the station talking about that and but they don't want to reveal like where they find this because it is an endangered species so they're trying to kind of keep that hush hush yeah it makes sense that's fascinating i did not realize that there was any species that lived in trees. Yep. <laughs> um, knowing that they're living in trees, are they trying to see if there's other species living in trees, or are they just focused on getting more research on the the green one since it's threatened? I think they're focused primarily on that one. Uh, they, they do climb trees. They don't go like way up in the canopies, to my knowledge. But at night, when you go out looking with flashlights, um, you'll see salamanders up the sides of trees and even on like tops of little ferns and stuff because they're safer from predators, like snakes and things up on the perch up on these plants. So they do climb small plants regularly, but whether or not they live up in the canopy, that's the only one I'm familiar with at the moment, at least in the state. <laughs> well, uh, 
I don't see any more questions popping up in our chat. If anyone else has any further questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself to ask them. Um, I know this has been incredibly fascinating for me. I've learned a lot. Um, I did earlier throw, and I can throw it in again, the link to uh, your your presentation from last year about um, um, mortalities of shrews and small shrews, mammals. Yeah. Um, uh, without the, getting into a lot of detail, I'll just say it's, I study shrews. They go into little bottles on the sides of the roads. They die in the bottles. So if you pick up bottles, you can find all these skeletons in, in the bottles. <laughs> I will say it was also a very fascinating uh, presentation to learn about how you were studying the shrews and uh, small mammals using roadside trash. <laughs> yep. So I uh, reposted that link if you're interested in watching that. Um, there is that. Um, but if nobody else has any questions, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Patrick, thank you for coming back again this year and presenting for us. This is but another fascinating presentation. Um, and with that, I'd have a great night, everyone. Um, be 